Thank you. Thank you. Um, this presentation is basically just three prong, three parts. It's my travels, it's the culture of the people I paint, my subject matter, and also my painting technique. So, and it's how they all three entwine. Because obviously, you see my subject matter, they're, they're natives from all over the world. So I'm gonna first start, and you know, pictures a thousand words, as we all know as artists. Um, and I, I'm moving pictures even more. So I'm gonna start with a five minute movie, of some of my travels, and I, uh, it ranges from South America to Southeast Asia to uh, the Tato Humada, which are my favorite people to paint. So it's about five minutes long, and it really says a lot of what I do. My paintings are, are unique in the aspect of the way that the, the pastel, when it's pastel, I also paint in oil, is applied. It is actually ground in very heavily and there's a layer of spray that goes over that, that binds the, the medium right to the paper. My work really involves light on my subject matter. I paint native cultures and when light hits form, in that form creates shapes. And in those shapes is where I get my dramatic color. I mean, I'm always constantly thinking uh, lighting and color and painting and dimension. And even when I paint, I'm always painting in the round. The, the subject is two-dimensional and my work is two-dimensional. But when I'm painting, I think in the round. I paint a nose. I'm thinking of carving it around. I have an affinity with the people that are most primitive. and. Um, that affinity has brought me to paint them. Also, I love places like Guatemala. Obviously, the color is a dream for an artist to paint. Uh, all the clothing, the wraps, and the, uh, the woven patterns of color are, are just outstanding. The Indiana Jones theme has been hooked on to me through my, uh, in my younger days, I, I lived quite an adventurous life uh, traveling to, to Amazonian tribes, and to me, it was an adrenaline rush. The, the more dangerous, the more secluded some of these Indians were, the, the more I would want to visit them. Uh, it's a tremendous love of mine to, to go around the world and to meet different people from different cultures and learn their ideologies. And um, So it was like the innate anthropologist in me had to find out how the other half lived. There was a a question I always wondered, I mean, it, the most primitive people on the face of the earth, at the core of that, are they noble people or are they people just the same? I, I believe I discovered that um, the simple life is, is, is more noble. There would be times when the, the places I would stay would literally be under the stars. So I, you just have to make ends meet. In many of these places, I bought motorcycles that I felt that the motorcycle it was most accessible because you can go on trails, uh, sometimes jeeps. I, horses I've been on, I mean, if it moved, I was on it. If I can pitch a tent and I'm okay on my own out in the wilderness. So I don't have a problem with uh, doing that. My paintings are very much like a uh, mosaic. There are all these pieces like nuts and bolts that are put together and make the whole thing as one. And, w and when you see my work, that's one thing you notice, is you see extreme light. Take uh, Rembrandt, for instance, painted the same way. Use that drama of light to, to create shape. And that's, for me, that's what it's about.
What I paint is designed to give the viewer the experience of that particular culture. You know, these paintings are my poetry, and I, I just hope that the viewers can interpret them. And I've traveled millions of miles and hiked thousands of trails and endure, endured all kinds of hardships just to reach my subject. So, I'm going to dive into like two cultures. One is the Amazon, and then the other is India. Now, in the Amazon, I made several trips from the, in the 1980s, mid 80s, all the way to the early 90s. And I went to, and you saw some footage of some of these people. And the first one I went to was a tribe called the Tycuna. And you can't, a tourist just can't go and fly in. You have to have special permission. So, I, I probably should talk into the mic. So, um, in order for me to get the key to get into the, to get to see these people, um, I had made a National Geographic on assignment fake pass. <laughs> so back in the 80s, exacto knife, Colored copy machine, <laughs> the National Geographic magazine. I put it all together. So, and it's it's amazing to see that how National Geographic is quite honored by people that deal with uh, the, the uh, what pilots and so forth. So they saw that, and they I'm sure they pay them very well. Which I didn't have much money at the time, so they were probably sorely disappointed with me. <laughs> but anyway, that got me access to them. But I did, through my studies of National Geographic, get all my shots just so that they were protected. Because back in the 80s, there was still uh, epidemics with measles and, and other things that uh, the Indians were uh, contracting from outsiders coming in. And a lot of these people were afraid you know, of outsiders coming in. They didn't know what you wanted. So my first experience was quite amazing. And it was kind of like, uh, you ever see Dances with Wolves? That movie. It was kind of like that, I, but it was taking place instead of the plains in natives, it was in the Amazon. So they really, and I don't know why, they took me under their wing and um, I lived with them for three months and I got to eat with them, hunt with them, and even hunt monkey with blow guns and they were teaching me how to shoot them out of the trees and, and a lot of their rituals I pour, uh, partook in. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and I've got let's see some notes. There's a uh, okay. Uh, okay, with the tycoon, I saw this practice called Teltza. It's been, by the way, I don't know, 35 years. So <laughs> that's why I got to write this stuff down. A long time ago. So now this Peltzon ceremony is when a girl, she has her first menstru uh, the menstrual thing going. She has to wear, she wears a dress made of eagle feathers and shell snails, and she must jump over a fire all night. Yeah. And then it looks like a... After this, she's considered a woman and is eligible to marry. And uh, so that's one kind of strange thing that they do, <laughs> amongst many others. There's this stuff called, uh, that we ate, called manak. And it's kind of like a yam. Um, 
and it's it's actually a root. And whenever I saw that, I, I knew what that was. But a lot of things I ate, no idea what I was eating, and I, I know I didn't want to know. <laughs> a, friend of me, a friend of mine, like years later, says, Bill, you got to watch this program on PBS. You, you know, you were with these natives. And then I saw what I was eating, and it was these big fat worms. And had I had known that, I would have been a little reluctant. But anyway, when I saw like a fish tail, I was always happy about that. I knew what that was. So, um, so I went to like. Uh, four different tribes through the years, and I would stay months at a time. And like I said, it was quite extraordinary to, to be with these people. And um, at the time, there was like 45 native tribes living in the wilderness on their own, untouched from civilization. Now I hear there's like four, you know, and that's a matter of 34 years ago, 33 years ago. So it's quite diminished. There was um, a tribe I went to go see, it was called the Kofan tribe. Now this particular tribe, we had to hike through three days through the jungle to get to them. And there was a neighboring tribe called the Havera. Now in the 80s, there were still headhunters. So there was these little frontier towns that I'd first go to to get you know, access in. I, I couldn't get flown into this particular tribe, so we had a three-day hike through the jungle, the Amazon. And it's a, like a living hell to do that. Believe me, you don't sleep. And the, the, uh, the jungle just moves. It's constantly moving with life. You can break, you can get on your knees and break it down to one square inch. I'll guarantee you something is alive in that square inch. You know, other than a plant, mind you. Um, so we had three days of this. And the, the guide, had warned me. He said, I have to tell you, this is very dangerous because if the Havero catch us in their territory, we'll be a necklace. <laughs> and he showed me pictures of the Havero and showed me shrunken heads and so forth. So he says, we're taking a big chance. He says, I'm going to really ask for a lot of money because I'm risking my life to take you. I said, okay, how much do you want? Well, he wanted, uh, you know, translated into dollars a whole sixty dollars. Oh. So I was like, you drive a hard bargain, but okay. <laughs> so we went and I'll just tell you it's kind of a little Indiana Jones story. We went about halfway through and like I said, you don't sleep. And literally. You know, we had hammocks, you gotta be off the jungle floor. And in a muscatera because the mosquitoes are horrible. So uh, we're about halfway and I was, we were walking on the trail, and you've got to, these trails are overgrown in just a matter of days. So it's like chop, chop, step, step, chop, chop, step, step. That's kind of the MO in the Amazon. It just grows, overgrows so quick. So we were walking, and there was a mudslide that took, I swear to you, half a mountainside just down. And we could see where the trail was, where the, the mudslide took away our trail, but the other way around was like a whole day. So we had to walk on the edge of this very steep incline. And then at the bottom of the incline was a river, and a raging river, like a number four water raging river. So, rapids. And it was a, a sheer straight, it was, a, it was like this. Down like that, and then a sheer drop, a few hundred feet, rocks, and the whole nine yards. And raging water. So we had to be very careful on this mud that we walked below. I slipped. I fell and I slid rolling around trying to grab anything I could. And I made it down this, down the slide before obviously or else I wouldn't be here before the cliff area came but pretty damn close to where the cliff was. And I grabbed something like this, a twig. <laughs> And, you know, something, some vegetation that still remained was there. And I held on for dear life on this thing. Because it was my lifeline, literally. So it's amazing when your life is in danger, how you kick into overdrive. And I did. And I tell you what, it was probably, I'd say, 100 yards to the top. It took me three hours to get up there. And this is why. Because I took my fingers and I planted them inside the, the earth. 
because if I slipped, you know, chances are this thing would either be pulled out or wouldn't be there, whatever. So I would put my fingers in very slowly, same thing with my feet, and slowly up I went. My guide was up there the whole time, just sitting up there, just watching. <laughs> so, what's that? Couldn't throw you a rope. He had no rope. Yeah. But and by the way, if anybody has any questions, please ask at any time. You won't be interrupted. So anyway, that's just one little story about the Amazon and and. Um, but the interesting thing was the, the, the culture and how they lived and how they survived. And everything was revolved around survival. It was eating and shelter and so forth, which I said in that presentation there, the five minute movie, that how uh, simplistic some people live. And they seem to be very, very happy people. And uh, I don't, that, that tribe no longer exists. Were you painting from the beginning of No. This As a matter of fact, I had this great epiphany some years later. Hey, I love these native cultures. Why don't I paint them? You know, but it took at that time I wasn't painting these people. And did you get photographs and have to get permission for each photograph? Or? No, no, these people they another story regarding photographs. This is in the eighties when do you remember the camcorders? first came out, we got away from the, like, the Super 8 movies. Well, the camcorders were new on the scene. And I knew to get one. I, like I said, I didn't have much money. I think I got one on, I borrowed it. I mean, I, uh, I got it on a credit card or something. Because I knew this might be a very rare time for me to be with these people. I would love to get them filmed. So, do you remember the film, the portion of the five-minute movie where I took a bow and I was like that. Yeah. Well, that's the tycoon, that native standing there with the headdress, that's the tycoon. Now, I only have that little clip to show for, for bringing, with that truck, for bringing the, uh, the camcorder. And here's why, is the guy that shot that was another Indian. So he never seen anything like this. You can actually look in the viewer and play it and see moving people. You know, as, as we all know, but he didn't know that. They barely knew what cameras were. So, and like I said, very, very little in those days contact with the outside world. They knew what cameras were, but camcorders never saw it. So I showed the guy how to use this, and he took that footage of me. And that's all I have, and here's why. Um, and by the way, I studied through National Geographic on the do's and don'ts. And one of the don'ts was if they take something from you, do not ask for don't even ask for it back, let alone fight for it back, because that could, your life could depend on it. So um, he took, he ran off with it and showed people, and I didn't see it for two months. I didn't ask for it back, I did everything the way I was supposed to do. So two months later, he came to me real sad, like, and handed it to me. The and <laughs> batteries. So he played it. Yeah, he played it to the cows. And, uh, so that's why I only had that footage, that little bit of footage. But it's very valuable to me. Because it, how did yeah. the tribe die out? I mean, how's that? Uh, rubber tapers and gold miners and forestry and just the encroachment of civilization ate it up. Yeah, and that's the Colombian Amazon. I was in the Peruvian Amazon. The Kofan were in Ecuador. Um, and also uh, Peruvian Amazon, Colombia, and Brazil. So there was, there was four tribes that I saw. Um, how am I on time? Because I wanted to get to art. Is it 11.30? Uh, 11.30. 11 okay. All right. Move right, forget about Amazon. Even though, okay, this painting here is something I do have from the Amazon. So that's it. That's one. And I'll kind of pop it up on the screen. And it's neat because it's like a bird's eye view of a, of a little girl in a hammock. See it? Yeah. So I said.
the only one I have to show you in the Amazon, and I have very few of those. Okay, India. Now, India was in the late 90s. I bought a motorcycle in Calcutta, and for six months I circled India, just taking pictures. I went up through Nepal, and I'll tell you a funny story about, well, here's one for you. And this is regarding their culture and so forth. Now, when I hit Calcutta, I want to get a motorcycle, and that's how I wanted to travel. Why? Because the road systems back in the mid to late 90s were not good. The, I would say the best road looked like an old, broken down country road. And it was almost like a time war. It felt like the 1940s, because Gandhi institutionalized keeping their goods in and not importing. So they had like, it was kind of like Cuba, you know, 1940s automobiles and 50s. And it was like that. So the roads were really bad. So I thought a motorcycle would be good. And I used to race motocross, so I was pretty skilled at riding one. So anyway, I hit Calcutta, I'm looking for a motorcycle. And I see this man, motorcycles, looks like he's gonna sell them. And he's sitting down, I go over to him and say, hey, and these, sometimes they speak English, especially in the larger cities. He spoke English. So I said, are you selling this one? I kind of like this one. It was a 1952 Einfield motorcycle. And like I said, they're old. <laughs> so uh, he, he goes like this. He did this little shake, almost like a dance. <laughs> so I asked him again. He didn't say anything. He just did this thing like this. <laughs> so I asked him again, uh, you selling it? He does the same thing. It's shake. I said, ooh, he's got Tourette's. <laughs> so I go over to another guy. I said, hey, those, yeah, go ask him. I said, I did, but he, he, did, he did a dance. <laughs> so I go, and then he says, yeah. So I thought, what in the world was that? I said, I like that. How much you want? I bought it. Long well, story, it wasn't so easy to get a permit. Yet in India, you got to pay people off. <laughs> you really do. It's a very corrupt system, or it was back then. Hopefully it's better now. But, uh, so I hit the road and uh, went up through Nepal. Now when I hit Nepal, I look on my map. I look on the map and to get to Kathmandu, it's, a, it's one inch on the map. Okay? So I'm at the border and, and this is from the border of India to Kathmandu, one inch on the map. The guy goes, don't go that way, go this way. So if you measure off, it's one foot. So I said, one inch, one foot, I think I'm going to take the one inch way. Even though I was advised not to. Turns out that was very good advice. Should always listen to the locals. <laughs> and I didn't, and I was in for it. Why? Because it was, I, we went up through the Himalayas, or I did. And I even hit snow. It was a good thing I used to race motocross, because it was like a 300 mile motocross track. It was so bad and rough. Now get this. This, it, it was so far that there, then there's no gas stations. It's, you know, <laughs> I ran out of gas about a quarter of the way there. So, and it's strange because inevitably I always get out of things. And I don't know how I, must, I must have part Mr. Magoo in me or something. But I always get out of these situations. I run out of gas. So there's nothing in sight. And there can be 50 miles and you don't see anything but wilderness. So I, I put the bike on a kickstand, start walking. Half a mile, I see a building. I, walk, I go knock on the door, as a person there. Hey, ran out of gas. He doesn't speak English, but I, I make my point. He said, I'll sell you some, I got in Coke bottles. So I get as many Coke bottles I carry, I go back, but it's very costly. <laughs> How much? Three bucks, it's gonna, well, okay. <laughs> so with the Coke bottles, I filled up the, the motorcycle and off I went. But, this will shock you, I think. Right about halfway up, and this is when I was at the, about the highest, and I didn't have clothes well enough to be in snow. I was in snow on that motorcycle, sliding around in mud. And I saw, sitting on the side like two humans, about six foot pure white monkeys, two of them, sitting on a wall. So I'm riding like this, and I look left, and these two monkeys just, or apes, I don't really know how, what they were. They were the, they were the white Sasquatch, but they were big. And they were white, and they looked at me as I 
was making the turn. <laughs> I looked at them. I don't want to stop. They probably didn't want me to stop either. But incredible. So now, and then here's some of these cultural barriers. Oh, let me get back to the shaken thing. So traveling through India, I found, I saw this as a common thing with them. They, you know, when you ask them a question, they'll do this. And it, it's in between yes and no. It's a bit strange. But anybody that's been in India knows that that's body language to say yes. You know, they do this thing. But all over India, not just in Calcutta. So I want to explain that, that the guy did not have Tourette's. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so up through Nepal, um, and here's one of those cultural things. I knew not to put your hand on a child's head because you pat down the chakra. So I went to many villages. I had an interpreter on the back of the motorcycle. Had I done that, it would have been trouble for me in those villages. So, and I do that. I mean, my instincts are to pat kid on the head and so forth. But, and had I done that, like I said, it would be trouble. It's one of those cultural things. If you don't know, you can get yourself in trouble. So, so anyway, okay. That's my, a couple of my travel stories. So we're going to get to art here. And let me get my text. <coughs> yeah, I've got some, I've got some good old-fashioned quotes for you. Some of these are mine. Some are. Does anybody know who Mary Silverwood is? Yes. 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 Yeah, she's great. She to me is a legend. Brilliant artist. So some of these are mine, some of these are hers. So art quotes. Here's one. You should remember, it isn't what you see, it's how you see it. Okay, another. You don't want to leave out the poetry, but learn composition so well that poetry enters on its own. What music is to the ear, color is to the eye. A painting should sing a song of color to the viewer, the same way that notes compose a, mel a melody for the listener. Another. To make good art is one thing, but to make extraordinary art and move away and move way past what is considered good art. Everything matters. Composition, choice of color, value selection, style, and design. Like making a cake of quality. All the right ingredients make a good cake, right? So, same is true with art. It's not one, it's everything. All at once. So let me pull out my arrow. Let's get some tools first. This one here. Okay, I'm going to also pull it up on the screen. Good to know the rules before you break them. <laughs> and with, with authority and then expand them. It takes discipline. So and that's true, especially for me, because I'm not formally educated in painting. So I was never in a box. So I had to find my own way in art. And that's good in a way. I mean, like that quote says. It's good to know the rules because that's just more in your arsenal. But then you gotta move outside, outside the box. So, okay, Native Kuma actually is, let me get that out of there. The one on the screen has a dark background, and the, that one has a light background. All right, that is a Native Kuna. I spent uh, two weeks in the San Blas Islands photographing these guys, and they were a pleasure, really good people. So, okay. Me, there is a particular. Pan Panama. This is Panama. That is correct. There's actually a, maybe not. 
All right, let me zero in on the face. So I want you to see the face here. Yeah, that's pretty big. Okay. Now, I, I counted the colors in this face. There's 48 different colors, none of which are flesh tone, yet it looks like flesh, right? So that's kind of my thing is, is the colors in face. I think a lot of people recognize my work through the faces. And there's many complementary colors. With some, they're off key, right next to each other. For instance, look at that little slice of color. And this is kind of fleshy, but this is not so. So I've got complementary colors working all through the piece. But then I'll throw a little monkey wrench like that, and little dots of blue and so forth. But yet it works, right? I mean, up close, it's, it's an abstract painting. But you go distance from it like that, and it becomes, you know, more, we'll say, more realistic. So, and like I say, that's, I'm kind of known for reflective colors. And that's what a lot of this is in here, is reflective colors. And these reflective colors really come off of the garments from the greens in the jungle. There's bouncing colors. When sunlight hits, for instance, um, her blue shawl there, you know, it'll, there'll be blue bouncing off her cheek. And what I do is I exaggerate. You know, I pull that blue out and really show that, like right here, you got some green blues working, right? So that comes from the, the sunlight coming right off her right shoulder there. I have a question. Yep. Did the subjects that you painted see your finished work? You know, and sometimes I'd go back, especially amongst the Tarahumata, with my little 8 by 10 chiclets that I would bring and give them. I'd give them their photographs, but also show them some of my work. Very pleased all the time. Yeah. For instance, in Guatemala, I was with the Ashil, and far removed from civilization in jungle area. And this uh, couple didn't know I was up in the hills photographing, and I photographed their wedding. So I went back three years later with a stack of photos of their wedding. And it was beautiful because they had all the best colors out. And uh, the woman just cried. She said, I had no idea you were anywhere you know, around the vicinity. And she was just enveloped in her wedding, obviously. So it was neat to see that kind of reaction. So but, your, your movie, in your movie it shows you sketching on site. Right. Do, you, do you do that also? Yes. So yeah. you bring your pastels? Yes, mm -hmm. occasionally, not too often, but usually it's just sketch work. Yeah, just to keep that fresh. And yes. when you were in the film where you were sketching, right. what interest did the, your subject show to your drawing? I mean, a photo is one thing with right. a camera, but... What was their reaction to my painting? Yeah. I don't think it was really that different from the photo because they're not exactly, they haven't exactly been introduced to the arts and they're, they're not yeah, you know, privy that to that. Yeah, I would think it very alien. It is, it is. A lot of them, unfortunately, oh, I don't know, I would, maybe we shouldn't say it first, but you know, the, the, the thought of exploitation enters their mind. Oh, so you're making money you know, off of me kind of thing. So to counteract that, and I know intuitively, I know that that happens, and and sometimes for good reason to to counteract it with bringing the people, and I always come bringing something. You know, a lot of people I know now, like in the village of Chokita, I brought generators to them. So I do come give it, and you know, I just don't want to take from them. And also, I ask some of them, can you? And I don't like necessarily posed shots. I like them just going about their business when I shoot. But occasionally I'll, I'll do a post shot, but I'll pay them, you know, whatever they want usually. And it's usually not very much. So, but I've been, you know, in my younger years, I've been in trouble with my camera. <laughs> I have everything you can think of thrown at me. <laughs> so, big trouble. I once ran from my life in the jungle because of photograph. And in this, in this case, it wasn't me that took the shot. It was somebody else. 
and we had to run out of there for our lives. <laughs> so, and that's a, another Indiana Jones story. That's a long one. <laughs> but okay, let me know else about that. Okay, yeah, for me, the drama of light, along with the effects of color, create an in interesting array of definely, of fine, defined shapes. And like I said when I spoke in that film, it's the nuts and bolts for me that put it all together as one. So it's these shapes that just fit. And by the way, if you get the shape right, and you all know this as artists, if you get the shape right, you don't really need much detail to follow. But getting that shape is essential. So, and obviously, the values too matter. Okay, so that was the Kuna. How much time do I got? What's that? 20 minutes. 12, okay, good. That should be just about right. Okay, the next one is the Children of the Sun. These are the Tarahumara, and that was from a photo. Now, I paint with photos, so I take them to the studio, and I have a process with that. I'll make an 8x10, but now I have this giant monitor about this big right above my easel, so I can make the nose this big. And there's a, you can't print out um, enough color that the monitor picks up. The monitor is always better. But it's good to have two references because it, the printout will, will have a different color, different hues than your monitor. But in the darks, you don't, sit, don't print out well. And that's where you can pick up a lot in the monitor is in the darks, you know, in the shading. So... I use both as a reference. I also make a black and white, and that serves me for values. So I actually have three references, so you all might want to try that, see if it works for you. But okay. So this one is called Children of the Sun. And uh, my process starts out with mapping out shapes, and I always go with the highlights first. So the focal point for me is always the faces. That's where the power lies. So, and I'm a figurative painter. I like figures, and I like figures with landscapes, but I always like painting figures. I just think there's more power in it. Um, and I'm very careful to draw the contour lines of the shapes. So how I map it out is I'm gonna paint, or I'm gonna draw this. See all that? All the shapes in here? If you took away the paint, you saw the drawing, you would see all this is drawn out. You know, so I call that mapping out. So, and I paint highlights first, and I know we're taught to go from dark to light. I don't do that. I go from light to dark. Sometimes I'll go from dark to light. So, I just work with both. So, um, like I said, it's mapped out, even the clothes, the highlights. Yep. All the highlights in the clothes, all that's mapped out with drawing. And like I said, if you get the shape right, especially in the faces, anatomically you get it right. Um, that, uh, that's, that's a major plus. You don't need to, to get much detail afterwards. Is the drawing on a separate surface than what, the, what you use for the painting? Or do you draw on the same surface no, you want to paint on? Yeah, and I typically now, I, I gesso boards. You know, I'll put pastel ground. I also paint in oils, too. So the past two years, year and a half, I've been painting in oils. Started that up again, and that's, that's been good. But I know we're the Pastel Society, and these are pastels. So, and you can kind of see the intricacy of all that. And like I said, it's a mosaic style painting, you know. It's very abstract, but you get away from it, it, it works. See that? Is that picture on the screen the same as the painting that's on this thing? Yes you and did no. it twice. Yes. I, yes. Okay. That's, that's the candy cane girl there in the white. Okay. And this one's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. And the background, background is in the background. So I painted it twice, yes. Okay. And that's not a typical thing I do, but I did in this case. Question? Yes. When you draw out those facial shapes, yep. starting with the lights, highlights, you're not including your mosaic at that moment, you're just doing lights. The, 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 drawing it out is the mosaic. That's where it starts. 
I'm doing all the highlights first, even the clothes. But like I said, I'll, I always start out with the face. For me, the face is the focal point, all the faces, not just one. And everything has got to revolve from there out. But you draw. But I draw this in. See all this? The extreme highlights. Yeah. All that goes first. All the real bright highlights. And that's what I paint first, is the very bright, bright highlights. And those little mosaics of color, you plan those out at that stage? You know what? I would say 70% of it is mapped out. And then after that, I go by feel. I say, hey, you know what? Let me sneak. Let me sneak this little green in here, this little blue green. You know what? I'll, I'll play with it. You know, it's a dance. So that's how that works. Let me see here. Yeah, I like okay, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, much exaggerated color, but yet that color is there. You know, and I tend to like, say, a cartoon character. Nixon, big nose. That nose is huge. It's really not, but it comes across. You know, he's he's accentuating something. <coughs> I'm doing the same thing, but I'm doing it with color. So, okay. All right. Next painting. So these ones are actually the ones present here. The corn grinder is the next. It's the corn grinder. And that's a Tato Humada native. And this pick was like from the 80s. So um, I've gone there probably 30 something times by now. I started going in the 1986 was my first visit to Copper Canyon. I saw, when I first moved here to New Mexico, I'm from New York originally. When I first moved to New Mexico, I went to Juarez in 1985 and saw these very colorfully clad people in the streets begging. And I asked the local, where are these people from? They can't be from the city. There's a special place here called, called Copper Canyon. But I can build it pobre in Spanish. So I made a trip there, and it was amazing. And my first experience, I lived in a cave with, with a family for, I say lived, it was like two days, you know. So I stayed, you know. And they still use stone tools. And I was amazed. You know, I was a young guy. I was, early 20s and so forth. And I had no idea 400 miles over the, the U.S. border, people were living in caves and using stone tools. So it was extraordinary to me to, to have that experience. So anyway, okay. And this is like early 80s, this pick. Um, Did they speak English? No, some of them, no, none, zero. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, further away like deer, they just go away from civilization, way into the recesses of the canyon. Some of them don't even speak Spanish, only Tarahumara, their native tongue. Did you learn those tongues? Oh, I, two words. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I can speak Spanish, okay, but yeah, Tarahumara. Now this one, um, yeah, let me just say that, you know, there's a lot of great artists that I've seen out there especially these days, you, you go on Instagram, wow, there's some great talent. But it surprises me sometimes, some of these guys and gals, great artists, like I say, but they lack composition. And a lot of them use colors too bright. I see that time and time again. They don't know how to use neutrals. So, and composition. I mean, like I said, all these things matter. They make, they bake the cake, the good cake that you want to eat. Okay. And yeah, composition, I think we all know, is just the weight and balance of items in the piece. Whether it's the foreground, middle ground, or background, it's the weight. And this, I know, this piece here is a very simplistic uh, composition, but it works. It's a, it's a good composition. Um, you know, it's well balanced with the mountains in the background and then the horizontal lines of the field coming this way. You know, that, that makes good composition. You know, I know my friend Mary Silverwood, she'd approve of the lines going this way. She was, <laughs> she was a master of, of lines and the focal point and composition. And she would tell me, it's like a master picking up a fiddle. It's not that he thinks about composition. He just plays it because he knows what he's doing. He knows how to do it. 
So in the same way, an artist should automatically know composition without really even thinking about it. Okay, yeah, the color scheme is, I've used a lot of neutrals. We all know what neutrals are, right? It's muddy down color. In this piece, <laughs> lots and lots. But, you know, I sneak in some of these bright colors, especially like some of the pieces you saw, the faces. I'll use neutrals, but I'll pop in some very bright color, but not too overpowering. So there's a balance to it. So, let's see. Could you show us some more pictures here? Some more paintings? Yeah. Yeah, no, I got another one coming. Good. <laughs> How much time do I got? I got actually one more. And that would be. Oh, yeah. I click on them. Okay, this is the last one. And then I can click on pictures. Yeah, I did. But this, ex for me, exemplifies my mosaic style. That's what I call it, a mosaic style. Because like I always say, nuts and bolts. And they're, you know, these pieces are very separate. You know, the original's right here. But yeah, and I did bring out the corn grinder. This really, for me, exemplifies, it's probably better to look at that, right? Um, my mosaic style, because it's very choppy. It's very cut. And what I mean by that is the highlights are very cut. For instance, right here, all this. And all this is design. It's not necessarily in the photograph. You gotta deviate from the photograph because we've got a brain to interpret art, not interpret photos. Yeah, again, there's many colors in here that are complementary, but some are not. You know, to a small degree, like I say, I sneak in these uncomplementary colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, any questions? Would you tell us about the beginning when you decided that you were going to paint? Hey, natives. natives? Like I said, it was an epiphany. All of a sudden, love these cultures. There's colors all over the place. And it and was... And how you discovered that you could draw, and right. how you decided to use pastel. You know what? I was not a skilled drawer. I don't think I have a natural gift. I just wanted it so bad. I worked at it so hard that I became skillful at it. So as far as natural ability, I, you couldn't tell my stick figures from anybody else's. <laughs> yeah, but some people just never can improve their drawing, you know what I mean? So you, you did it. I did it because I was passionate about it. I wanted it bad. So bad. Yeah. And so, why pastel? Well, I paint oil. I started with oil. I saw George Carlson. I know Bud knows George. He's a good friend. He is... He is the best I've ever seen. I saw one of his paintings and it just blew my mind. How he used color and that's what did it for me. And that was in the late 80s or so. I saw one of George's pieces. And I said, I don't know what he's doing, but whatever he's doing, I want to do it. So I kind of mimic George's work. You know, a lot of people, even to this day, said, your work looks so much like George's. Yes, it does, but I've moved away from George, his style, because it was his style. You gotta find your own. And I always say, make it your own. So, speaking of George, I saw him, I did like a pilgrimage to honor him. And to, so I went up to Idaho where he lives and um, I showed him some of my work, you know, just eight by tens. And he said, my God, how did you, you know, untrained, how did, because he's very trained. He's got a doctorate in the arts. He said, how did you come to do this? I said, from you, thank you very much, and my friend Mary Silverwood. So he says, so I taught you without even speaking a word. And he did. Why? Because all the information is right there. His work, when I looked at it, all the information was right before me. I just had to figure out how he did it. So I, I painted like that, but I knew I need to be my own artist and not 
somebody else's, you know, just copying somebody else's work. As much as I love George, George's work, and I have, you know, glad to say. Well, you had your subject matter. And that's something we had similar to, is I painted, the, I was painting in oils the Tata Humada, and, and before I even knew George was uh, painting pastels of the Tata Humada, before I was. But, and that was part of the epiphany, is seeing George's work and it just, you know, and I told him face to face, you know, you basically changed my life. Well, seeing your work, the, the first time I laid eyes on it, just so inspired me, even though I was still on the trail to become an artist, but that really got me motivated. So, yeah. Can you show us a couple yeah. more before you Okay, <laughs> oh sure. Just rain some wax, yeah. Sure thing. Let's see, here's an oil I did. I know this is the Pastel Society, this might be sacrilege. That's okay, that looks familiar. Yes, <laughs> because I did this with that. But that's the full scene. And that's kind of on hand that I didn't deviate from, you know, yeah. Do you paint one subject several times over, like I think we've now seen three versions of this? You know what, almost never. In this case, I have. <laughs> but honestly, you know, I won't do that very often, but I just like this so much. These faces like that clump together. And composition-wise, I think it's a, it's a hit. Um, and I, I work from left to right, even with my oil, and you know, because you'll do that, and you'll tend to smear it if you don't, right? Everyone knows that. So I'll base, I'll do 80% of this, all these, but then, you know, working down here, all of a sudden my eye will catch something up here. I say, wow, you know what? Why don't I put a little purple right over here? So I'll occasionally, you know, go back and forth to what I think is finished. So sometimes I ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all? Since you're working with people that maybe haven't seen a process of art like this. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, did anybody get upset like that's me there and I don't want you to do that? There was a tribe I was with called the Awaka in northern Colombia. It was in the Amazon. And they believed the old world way that if you take their photograph, their spirit is in there. Mm -hmm. And you took a piece of them. And a buddy of mine took a photograph. And we had, that's where I, I was saying we had to run for our lives. <laughs> with bows, arrows, and spears being thrown at us. So it was that bad. Yeah. So in that case, yes, but never after that, and that was in the 80s, I've never had a problem, spiritually speaking, with somebody thinking that. Although in Central America, in like Chiapas area, the older ones tend to be very uh, angry about photographs. So, and, and these days I'm a lot, I'm, uh, not so intrusive as I was. Obtrusive, intrusive. So I used to just go guns ablaze and blaze and just shoot everything. Didn't care. And you know, I paid the consequences sometimes. It wasn't good. So I learned not to do that. So then I started getting a little smarter, going giving, you know, something. And then, and if they don't want the shot, I, d I definitely don't force it. I just, fine, you know. You know, it's sad sometimes because I will see some subject matter so good. And they'll say, oh no. And, you know, as a younger guy, I was just went, oh, okay, boom, <laughs> and then run away. <laughs> no, but I won't do that. Do they, feel the same, go ahead. do they feel the same way about you drawing as the photos that you're I, stealing? No problem stuff? drawing, ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they're always interested. If you saw the little film there, I was actually pastel. Some of them were just looking, you know, mm -hmm. laughing. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's neat to, uh, you know, you... You've got it in your, your back of your lens now, the digital, and you show them. Then you know it breaks the ice too. They they like to see that, and it's not you know, as these cultures I go to now, it's become less and less of a problem amongst the youth. Why? Because the encroachment of the world. They already know about it. When I was out there in the 80s, it wasn't so uh, welcoming or even known like amongst the Amazonian tribal people. So photographs were. You, to be very cautious about. So, and then, yeah, we were told with the Awaka, if you get caught taking a picture, you're dead. You 
know, we were told by our guide, don't take a picture of them, they'll kill you on the spot. So, of course my friend had to. Do you have the picture from the list uh, that you won the award for at Masterworks? Is that on here? Oh, uh, let me see. Maybe some people haven't seen it. Please. Yeah, that one's called the Stone, Stone Staircase. Now here's one, no, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I don't. Or, oh. Let me see, no I don't. But here's one I just did of a native here. Oh no, that's the photo. <laughs> there is it. Yeah, I went to Santo Domingo just last two weeks ago and did a painting. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? This is Nepal. <laughs> Any guess what that is? I thought it was a horse, but it's a goat. Yeah. That's in Nepal. Let's see. Do you still go back to visit? I do. I nearly went this year, but there was so much problems at the border. And they have a, what's called Semana Santa. It's a annual festival in a place called Noragachi, where it's the top of the canyon, of Copper Canyon. They come from 30 miles, and there's a couple thousand in a small village. And it's a four-day festival, and it's a paradise for photographers. And there's photographers from all over the world. So, and that was in April. It's an Easter celebration. And they mix their, uh, some of their native beliefs with Catholicism. They've been doing this, Semana Santa, for 500 years now. Yeah, and uh, I was going, but there was problems at the border this year about perhaps the border shutting down. I thought maybe I'd be stuck there, and yeah, didn't want to be there for this Christmas. Um, let's see. Did you see about the change in the culture? Oh my God! You know what? I'd compare it when I first went in the '80s. The culture, I would compare it to here in the States to the 1870s. So it'd be like, go and see the Sioux, Indians in the Plains in the 1870s. So now, reel back to the 1950s. So there's barely a remnant left. Like the 1950s would be here in the States. That's how it is there. From only 30 years of time passing. 30 years did that, about almost like what 100 years did here. So it's quite remarkable to see, you know, the decay of it. But, you know, that's, I guess, Probably. that's something, yeah, <laughs> yeah. inevitably going to happen. Um, you saw that. How much time do I got now? Oh, Just one more. <clears throat> you have some images from India? That's me with uh, <laughs> some tribal people. That was, uh, I think, uh, the Chipabu in Peru. Um, say again, I'm sorry. Shots from India. Here's one. Ah, yeah. No, that don't work. Let's see here. Okay, I was in the Darien Strait, and that's between Panama and Colombia. Uh, that was the. Chicoy tribe. And then kind of a quick funny story, when I arrived, it took three days, by the way, with canoes. These guys, I hired these guys to take me in. It took three days. We had to get flown to a place called El Real, and we took a canoe three days down these small water passages to get to this tribe. So when I arrived there, there was a film crew doing a documentary on these people from Columbia University. They saw me. And they started yelling, out, we have permission from the chief, out with you. So what did I do? I flashed my National Geographic. <laughs> I said, well, 
um, I'm this. Tonight you dine with us, they said. <laughs> they were very, I mean, I tell you what, National Geographic has got quite a reputation. I know that first <laughs> Hopefully I didn't smear them. Well, okay, here's, I used to, you know, I traveled a lot with motorcycles. And that was in Indonesia. So I, why? Because of the access. Obviously, the car's not going over that. So I, I learned to go by way of motorcycle in a lot of countries. So it was kind of my MO. Get off the plane, go right to the motorcycle dealership. Considering all these places you've been, why do you live in Albuquerque? <laughs> It's better than New York, that's why. <laughs> well, it's close also to uh, the Tarahumata, who I probably 70% of my subjects are the Tarahumata, and it's my favorite. Oh, here's, here's a good shot. This is, I like this painting. And that's, that's a Tarahumata. Could you, could you center that? Could you move it over? Here? Sure. And that's very mosaic. That, again, exemplifies my mosaic style. <laughs> See, it's, the, it's all these shapes that make it the mosaic. Do you have a photograph of that particular piece? No. Of the I, actual photograph you've worked I do, but I don't have it on here. I keep all the old photographs of my pieces. But. Can you enlarge the face? So I'm sorry, so, what? Can you enlarge? Oh, yeah. So we see the mosaic. Yeah. Okay. And this is pastel. So, and I tend to use uh, a lot of the softer, like Sennelier and Schmincke pastels. How fast do you work? Pretty fast now. I mean, something like this would have probably taken me um, two weeks. Now I can do it in about a week. And it's not because I'm rushing it, it's just I'm more sure of what I'm doing. Yeah. Let's see, what else? Okay, I'm going to show that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we'd like to thank you. It's 5 after 12. So okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.